Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Boss, and The Incredible Hulk is finally streaming on Disney+. Plus. And since so many things from this movie are coming back in next year's Captain America Brave New World, Tim Blake Nelson as the leader, Thaddeus Ross as a rumored Red Hulk, Liv Tyler's Betty Ross is returning, and since we've learned so much about Bruce Banner as a character in She-Hulk, we thought we have to revisit the 2008 Hulk for clues, details we missed before, and an explanation of why this movie is now able to stream on Disney's platform. So let's dive in, and New Rockstars is now on three channels, this main channel for Easter egg breakdowns, my channel The Deep Dive for deeper analyses of classic titles, and The Break Room, which is our new home for our Inside Marvel reactions. Subscribe to all three and support us with one of our shirts from nerdriot.shop. Okay, we open on a logo that we're not used to seeing in front of a Marvel movie, Universal Pictures. Bit of history here, in the 1990s, Universal bought the rights to two characters from Marvel, the Hulk and Namor the Submariner. Namor made his MCU debut in 2022's Black Panther Wakanda Forever, but Universal made two Hulk movies, the 2003 Ang Lee Eric Bana film and this 2008 film as part of Marvel Studios' official launch, coming out in the same month as the first Iron Man film. But the rights to the Hulk character are believed to have shifted back fully to Marvel as of June 2023 assuming a 15-year licensing period under the terms of the Paramount deal that Universal also seemed to have made, according to a 2006 SEC filing. So the 2008 Hulk film came out in June 2008, 15 years later, June 2023. And that might explain why this Incredible Hulk film is now suddenly available on Disney+. Plus. So over these credits, we get an abbreviated recap of this Hulk's origin. All of the visuals were actually recreated from the 70s and 80s Hulk TV show intro. Like we see Banner in some sort of science chair, getting bombarded with gamma rays, a green laser on his head, then we see him hulk out, but from a first-person point of view, injuring Betty Ross and her father, Thaddeus Thunderbolt Ross. But in the wreckage next to Betty, we see a science box with a label that reads Titan. In the comics, Titan is a villain who has been described as the Hulk's Hulk, a monster that the Hulk turns into when he gets angry. Thunderbolt Ross has a blood-red hand here, perhaps a nod to his comics alter ego, and perhaps his eventual form, the Red Hulk. Ross reappeared in Captain America's Civil War after a long absence, talking about a heart attack that he had that led to an epiphany and transformation. Harris and Ford will be taking on the character in the upcoming Captain America Brave New World due to William Hurt's death in 2022. We find out later that everything we're seeing Bruce go through here is part of the same super soldier experiment that Thaddeus Ross has always overseen. Amongst a pile of research, we see a book, Inventory of Rare and Endangered Tracheophyta of Amazonia. It's probably a resource that Bruce is using to look for a cure to his hulking down in South America. There's also a report of some sort of military organization having obtained hair and saliva samples. This harvesting of Hulk blood and tissue will become a recurring effort continuing through She-Hulk, and presumably in Captain America Brave New World, we are currently seeing it by the Scrolls in Secret Invasion, as they harvest enhanced tissue from various sources to make Super Scrolls. Also on the computer screen, we see a notice for a requisition request made to Stark Industries. We see Tony Stark at the end of the film approaching Thaddeus Ross about his Hulk program, tying this all in with the Avengers Initiative. There are also some schematics for this truck with a big cannon doodad on the top. This is a sonic cannon the army will use to fight the Hulk on the college campus later in the movie. It's actually the same exact technology that will later appear in the MCU on War Machine's armor when he uses it in the airport battle in Civil War and on Mysterio's drones in Spider-Man Far From Home, used on the Tower Bridge in London. There's a quick flash of a correspondence intercepted message letting us know that Bruce has been trying to get a hold of Betty and various other sources throughout the academic world. But then there's this memo from Nick Fury on S.H.I.E.L.D. letterhead. Now the events of this Hulk movie take place during Fury's Big Week, a time period in the MCU that includes events from this movie, from Iron Man 2, from Thor, and from the final scene at the first Captain America film. This is a big week that ultimately leads to the creation of the Avengers. I also like that this memo uses the term threat level red, because as we go through this, we're going to look at any clue we can that might point to the Red Hulk. There's a list of Banner's known associates, including the name Rick Jones, who in the comics is kind of a sidekick character who would go on to become a hacker known as the Whisperer. There's also the name Leonard Sampson, who we actually see later, the character played by Ty Burrell. Doc Sampson is another important character from the comics, but in this movie, he's a psychiatrist who's dating Bruce's ex, Betty Ross. Originally, this movie was going to open with an alternate scene where Bruce tries to kill himself. While we don't see it here, it was referenced in The Avengers. I didn't see an end, so I put a bullet in my mouth and the other guy spit it out. Hulk smashes the ice, which causes a shockwave that unearths Captain America's shield in the ice. You can actually see it here if you look closely. We catch up with Bruce meditating to the sound of a metronome. The implication being that this backstory info dump that we just saw was taking place inside his head. We hear the faint sound of a heartbeat gradually slowing down. We learn that Bruce has been hiding out in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, an unusually loud and crowded city. Maybe not the perfect place if you're trying to relax while being off the grid. I mean, at any time, the Fast and Furious crew could just roll through dragging a giant safe. The 2003 Ang Lee Hulk film left off with Bruce somewhere in the Amazon rainforest, and while this isn't meant to be an explicit connection to that timeline, it does 
generally pick up where that story left off. Bruce flips around the Brazilian TV and lands on a clip of the courtship of Eddie's father, which stars Bill Bixby, the same actor who would go on to play Banner in the Incredible Hulk TV show. The character was named David Banner for the TV series. It's just one of many nods to that series that appears in the film. Bruce learns breathing techniques from real life Brazilian Jiu Jitsu master Rickson Gracie. Edward Norton was extremely committed to this role, both in terms of his physical discipline and even writing passes of the screenplay. But he was not given credit by the Writers Guild for his contributions. This creative disagreement is something many artists would find at Marvel Studios over the year. Marvel wants screenwriters and directors who play ball with their executive's vision and actors who mostly just get buff and read the lines, with the exception of a few key ad libs. I am Iron Man. Bruce wears these little glasses here while he's fixing the machine, which he wears most of the time in the comics and the Mark Ruffalo version wears more often. He bleeds some goofy looking CGI blood into a soda assembly line. This tainted soda doesn't turn people into hulks, but rather just makes him sick. We learn in She-Hulk that the fact that Jennifer had a transfusion from a family member is the reason she got superpowers and not just a bad case of the gamma poops. Since Bruce is still learning the language of Portuguese, he doesn't misspeak the classic line. Não me deixe com fome. Não bom quando eu fome. Even though in Portuguese, the word for hungry and the word for angry are very different, Bruce communicates via encrypted messages with a Mr. Blue using the code name Mr. Green. An obvious reference to his alter ego, but also a nod to the color-based code names in Reservoir Dogs, which also starred Tim Roth. Thunderbolt Ross, chomping on his signature cigar, gets a report that a man in Milwaukee, who's played by Stan Lee, got gamma poisoning from Bruce's blood soda. This is the second MCU film, but it's actually the 10th Stan Lee cameo in a movie based on Marvel Comics characters. So really, Lee making these kind of cameos totally pretty predated the MCU. He popped up in stuff like the X-Men movies, the Fantastic Four movies, and the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy. We learned that the soda was bottled in Porta Verde, Brazil. Verde, of course, means green. Just a lot of nods to green in this movie. Future Abomination, Emil Blonsky, is briefed on Banner after Ross assembles a strike team at Fort Johnson. Fort Johnson named after Kenneth Johnson, creator of the Hulk TV series. We learned that Bruce has been implicated in the deaths of six people. Three were probably in the lab when he changed the first time, but Ross also mentions two Canadian hunters. So did Hulk spend some time in Canada? Or is Ross trying to pin some other crimes on him? Comics readers might hear the country of Canada and automatically think Canada's own Wolverine. He might have been the one really responsible for those. Wolverine and Hulk have thrown down on a number of occasions in the comics, the first one being Incredible Hulk 180. Now the MCU of course did not have X-Men at this point, but it could be a leftover line from when they thought they were going to do it in phase one. After all, one of Feige's alternate pitches for the Iron Man post credit scene, which also came out this summer of 2008, had Nick Fury saying this instead. As if gamma accidents, radioactive bug bites, and assorted mutants weren't enough. So yeah, I guess it's possible that in one version of this script with Thaddeus Ross, he had another super soldier, Wolverine, run around Canada, and he used the threat of the Hulk to cover his tracks. I mean, there was also that headline on the computer screen in She-Hulk reporting on a man with metal claws fights in bar brawl. Now, in case you weren't clear on whether or not Blonsky's a jackass, he shoots Bruce's dog. Now, it seems like it's just a trank dart, but that off-screen yelp is enough to make me still hate this guy all the way through She-Hulk. I'll never forgive him. Now, Blonsky was absent from the MCU until a brief cameo in Shang-Chi where we saw his abomination and alter ego getting his butt whipped by Wong in an underground fighting ring. He came back in She-Hulk with chill new vibes, haiku skills, a more in-depth backstory. The last we see of him, he's following Wong through a sorcerer portal into Kamartaj. So given how much Marvel has liked bringing characters from this movie back into the fold, we would not be surprised to see Tim Roth show up in either Captain America Brave New World or maybe the Thunderbolts. When I was a kid, cereal was like my main food. And now as an adult, most of the cereal I see is still for kids, except Magic Spoon. Magic Spoon is cereal reinvented. It's the same great taste that you remember, but upgraded with grown up ingredients. There's nothing artificial. It's high protein, keto friendly, gluten free, grain free, soy free, wheat free, and naturally flavored. Magic Spoon cereal has zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, four to five net grams of carbs in each serving, and only 140 calories per serving. If you're on the go and need a cereal bar instead, each Magic Spoon cereal bar has one one gram of sugar, 10 grams of protein, four net grams of carbs, and only 130 calories per bar. Magic Spoon even lets you pick your favorite flavors and build your very own variety box. You can choose from the best-selling cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, and maple waffle flavors, plus other awesome flavors including honey nut, blueberry muffin, birthday cake, and cinnamon roll. And you can add the cookies and cream and cocoa peanut butter cereal bars to your variety box. Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee 
guarantee. And if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. And if you're in Canada or the UK, no sweat. Magic Spoon ships to both. So click the link below or scan the QR code on the screen and use the code NEWROCKSTARS for $5 off or go to magicspoon.com slash NEWROCKSTARS to save $5 off your order today. Bruce, while hiding from the army and his work bullies, hulks out properly for the first time. We zoom in on his now green eyes in the same way as they did in the 1970s TV show. But during this fight scene, we only get glimpses of the Hulk from the shadows and through the scopes of the army guys. It's just a clever nod to the fact that the Hulk is more of a monster story than a superhero movie. This whole scene has classic horror vibes where the monster is scarier because you don't know exactly what it looks like at first. So after this incident, Banner makes his way up through South America, through Central America. He walks through the town and we hear a sad version of the hitchhiking music from the TV show. <laughs> Later, we actually see him hitchhiking in the rain. But then we get our first mention of the World War II super soldier program that gave us Captain America. For biotech force enhancement. Yeah, super soldier. So yes, a reminder that in the MCU, the origin of the Hulk is rooted in the same program that yielded Captain America and Hydra's Winter Soldier program, something explored more in the Falcon the Winter Soldier, characters like Isaiah Bradley, the same serum that the Flag Smasher stole and used. This entire wing of characters in the MCU are connected in a family tree that stems back to Steve Rogers and Red Skull. And also part of that family tree, at least in the comics, is Wolverine. Bruce heads to Stan Lee's Pizza, another nod to Stan Lee, whose real name was Stanley Martin Lieber. The pizza chef, Stanley here is played by Canadian actor Paul Souls, who voiced Bruce Banner in the 60s animated series, along with several animated Marvel characters, including Spider-Man. Bruce sneaks on campus, posing as a pizza delivery guy. Pizza time! And he delivers a pizza to Lou Ferrigno, who plays the security guard. Of course, the bodybuilder and actor who played the Hulk form in the classic TV series. Both Ferrigno and Stan Lee also had cameos in the Ang Lee Hulk movie. Bruce also gives pizza to Martin Starr, who later plays Peter Parker's teacher in Spider-Man Homecoming and Far From Home and No Way Home. Kevin Feige actually confirmed that star is playing the same character in all these movies. Betty stops into Stanley's with Leonard Sampson. It says that she's got to have a Mr. Pink, another nod to Reservoir Dogs. Mr. Pink was a character played by Steve Buscemi. She ends up spotting Bruce, who isn't being stealthy at all, and they reunite and almost share a kiss in the rain. Kisses in the rain, something we see a lot in the Marvel movies. Spider-Man, Mary Jane. I think we also saw one in Daredevil. It's just kind of a thing in the 2000s. The 2000s love to do that notebook shit. Ross uncovers a cryosync tank from Stark Industries, and the developer is listed as Dr. Reinstein, which was the alien is that Dr. Erskine used in the first Captain America film. We also see the words Vita Ray. Remember he mentioned Vita Rays as part of the process that activated the super soldier serum in Steve Rogers. So Blonsky gets injected with the serum, but it's a slightly different shade of blue than the dosage that Steve Rogers got, indicating that things are not gonna go the same way. You can actually hear his bones crack as they inject him. We know from Steve Rogers' screams in that first Cap film how much this procedure hurts, and it shows on Blonsky's face here. So onto the campus battle at Culver University in Virginia. The serum is already taking effect. Blonsky easily outpaces all the other soldiers. There is a totally gross moment, complete with squelching noises, where Bruce swallows that thumb drive to avoid Ross getting it. Yeah, good luck sifting for that later. Actually, YouTuber John Campia has a cameo as one of the guys firing smoke canisters. He said that he got in trouble for taking a selfie in costume. I mean, hey, maybe as with those leaked photos John posted from No Way Home, he just thought the movie he was acting in wasn't real. This battle between the Hulk and the army was redone in What If Episode 3 with Mark Ruffalo providing the voice and the appearance of Bruce Banner in the Hulk. When they reanimated the sequence, they made it Ruffalo's appearance, not Norton's. So in the MCU's eyes, when we look back at this movie, I guess we should imagine Mark Ruffalo and not Edward Norton. Ah, oh, this Edward Norton erasure. Bruce hulks out after seeing Betty get tackled. We get a classic dolly zoom shot of everyone's reactions. These two guys filmed this incident. We actually saw this same footage show up later in Iron Man 2 as part of the same research that Fury is doing to recruit the Avengers. The guys here are named Jim Wilson and Jack McGee. In the comics, Jim Wilson is Sam Wilson's nephew and a friend to Bruce Banner. Jack McGee is actually the name of the reporter from the 1970s, 80s TV series who is always trying to track down the Hulk. Also in the comics, Jim Wilson's father is Gideon Wilson and the character Gideon Wilson shows up in the She-Hulk series as a federal prosecutor who sent the abomination to prison. Hulk picks up a piece of wreckage and wields it like a shield, another parallel to Captain America. All these super soldiers just kind of instinctively do this. On the quad, they hit him with Stark's sonic cannons and Blonsky goes rogue, resulting in a bone crunching kick into a tree. Is that all you got? <laughs> Betty calls Hulk Bruce, which we know he usually hates. Bruce. 
you're Bruce Banner. Yeah. Right, 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 don't mention puny Banner. But he seems okay with it here. He actually does seem to calm down a bit until a helicopter shoots him with a whole mess of bullets. Later on, Betty takes Hulk's hand, just like Natasha does later on when she does her whole the sun's getting real low lullaby thing in Age of Ultron. Betty throws Bruce a pair of giant purple pants. Another Hulk signature clothing item. He shoots them down because this ain't your daddy's Hulk. His pants are a more muted color. There's a brief shot of a news report from WHIH News. This is a network that pops up throughout the MCU. The army we see uses S.H.I.E.L.D. server to look for Bruce. We actually see the S.H.I.E.L.D. logo come up on the screen. They deduce that the Mr. Blue he's been talking to is Dr. Samuel Stearns. This is a character with a lot of Marvel history. All of his comics variants eventually turn into the leader, the green skin, big skulled supervillain who is the brains that Hulk is to the brawn, an important figure in the organization known as the Intelligentsia. We see Stearns get a dose of gamma blood later in this movie, a twist that will finally pay off in 2024's Captain America Brave New World. Actor Tim Blake Nelson is confirmed to return, and there have been some set images of this actor in green makeup on his hands and arms, strongly hinting that his leader alter ego will be one of the big bads of that movie. And we finally meet Dr. Stearns, who is appropriately wearing blue. Later on, Blonsky forces Stearns to inject him with more of Banner's blood, and we get a shout out of Blonsky's future moniker. The mixture could be an abomination. Like the Hulk before him, we don't get a good look at Abomination at first. We see his destructive power so that we are appropriately afraid of him once a big throwdown happens. They shot the Harlem scenes in the city of Toronto. They did redecorate it by putting some things like Harlem's Apollo Theater in the background, but you can still see some Toronto specifics in the background. The Wire actor, Michael K. Williams, has a blink and you'll miss a cameo here. He filmed a longer scene where he tries to get Hulk and Abomination to stop fighting, but it ended up getting cut, which the actor was reportedly not happy about. Bruce jumps out of the helicopter, making his triumphant dive dive into the action and a move that is later parodied in Thor Ragnarok. The helicopter crashes into a sign for Williams Plumbing. Some prominent Williams in the Marvel comics include Simon Williams, the Avenger slash actor Wonder Man, who we're gonna meet in the MCU soon, and Riri Williams, whom we'll soon meet as Ironheart. But Williams is also a common name. I don't know if this Williams is connected to either of those, but Hulk and Abomination finally brawl. This battle is awesome, and it does get referenced all the time in the various Netflix series, where in Daredevil we see a newspaper with the headline Harlem Terror, Abomination spits out a tooth, which we will also see Hulk do later in Age of Ultron when he's fighting Tony in the Hulkbuster armor. If anyone wanted Hulk DNA or Abomination DNA, harvesting one of these teeth could be a good source of that. In case you're listening, Scrolls, Abomination uses his elbow spike to stab Hulk through the chest, and throughout the rest of the films, noticeably in Thor Ragnarok, you can actually see that scar on his chest, which is just some really great attention to detail. During this fight, Hulk uses his signature thunderclap, as well as his Hulk smash move. These moves, I think, would go on to be underused throughout the MCU titles, but the thunderclap did finally return in She-Hulk, and it's pretty great. Hulk gets the upper hand on Abomination and he rips out Abomination's elbow spike and turns the tables on him with a stab of his own. And yes, we should note between this movie and Abomination's return in Shang-Chi and in She-Hulk, they did redesign the character. The redesign with the gills and the greener color is more consistent with Abomination in the comics. In this movie, they definitely desaturated Abomination so that we could visually tell him apart from the Hulk. But practically in-universe, I think a good explanation is that these Hulk characters, the longer they stay in their Hulk form, gradually evolve and mature their appearances as the effects technology gets slightly better. So why while in exile, Bruce receives a package addressed to David B, another nod to David Banner, his name on the TV show. And in the opening credits, we did see his name listed as Bruce D. Banner. So presumably David is his middle name, but the return address is from Milburn Pawn Shop for Brad Milburn, one of the film's set designers. Inside is a necklace that Betty had to sell and Bruce keeps his promise to get it back to her. The final shot mirrors the shot of Bruce meditating at the beginning of the film, but now instead of trying to stay calm and rid himself of the Hulk curse, he is now working in tandem with the Hulk, embracing his other identity, setting up the great reveal in the Avengers that he's always angry. Now the typical post credit scene actually plays before the credits this time, just kind of on the other side of the cut to the credit of the movie. Tony Stark visits Ross in a bar where he tells him that the super soldier program was put on ice for a reason and he's always felt that the hardware was more reliable. Stark then tells him that they're putting a team together, but this scene later gets retconned later on in the short, The Consultant. In this short, Agent Coulson tells Agent Sitwell that Stark was actually sent in to use his famously off-putting personality to deter Ross, who it seems wanted abomination to join the Avengers. Stark's visit succeeded in keeping Abomination in prison, but this tells us that there's always been an infrastructure of government intelligence working against Thaddeus Ross. So as Thaddeus Ross steps into the presidency in Captain America Brave New World, that is going to be the central conflict. A determined government leader who wanted tight control over super soldiers versus a responsible government apparatus trying their best to keep the peace. And rewatching this movie has made me so excited for that fourth Captain America movie. Okay, that's it for my re-breakdown of The Incredible Hulk. Big thanks to our writers, Gina Ippolito and Jordan Morris for their 
their help with the script. Subscribe to New Rockstars, The Deep Dive, and The Break Room, and you can support us by grabbing some merch at nerdriot.shop. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at EA Voss. Follow New Rockstars and subscribe to New Rockstars for more analysis of everything you love. Thanks for watching. Bye.